Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with Meher Roy. And today, we're again speaking with David Schwartz and Jordi Bailina of Polygon for part two of our episode on the ZK EVM. We did an intensely technical episode last week, and today is more about the business and adoption side of Polygon ZK EVM. So before we talk with David and Jody again, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Omni is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols, so you can manage all of your assets in one place. But what's really special about Omni is what you can do inside the wallet. Want to get yield? Omni allows you to get the best APYs with zero fees and three taps. Need to swap? Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs, so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction directly in your wallet. Love NFTs? Omni offers the broadest NFT support of any wallet, so you can collect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains in one place. Omni is truly the easiest way to use Web3, and it's fully self-custodial, meaning you never have to trust anyone with your assets other than yourself and they support Ledger. Give Omni a try at omni.app. And without further ado, let's go to the interview. Let's talk about the network itself. So um, there's already a testnet live and the mainnet is gonna launch next month. That's in March. Um, so first of all, super easy question. Um, What's actually the relationship between Polygon, ZK EVM and Polygon? Because Polygon is kind of is kind of the standalone sidechain kind of thing. And Polygon ZK EVM is gonna be like a proper layer two on top of Ethereum, right? So what what's kind of the what's um uh, what's the relationship and what are the plans for kind of chain architecture and planning for the future? Well, uh, Polygon POS is the the product uh, Polygon is uh, you know running now. This is the chain uh, Polygon is providing service today. The the relationship is clear because uh, we are shipping a new network. Um, we are uh, building this uh, CK rollup model, which is a complete layer two, and uh, we are in the in the beta version in mainnet next month. So it's the the first release, and uh, we have plans to. Just uh, let these these networks, you know, uh, be be you know work together in in parallel uh, because they are different uh, services. One is uh, a side chain with um, a cost model and a, a running service, and we will have a, a different technology with a different cost model and a different uh, characteristics. So the plan today is to start this new network, and uh, we'll be providing. Let's say this whole vision very soon uh, from the from the Polygon perspective, how this uh, connects together, how the POS connects with the CKBM, with the supernets, uh, with uh, with Maiden, with Zero, all these uh, projects working together. Uh, we have a strategy to to connect all of them and to provide, uh, let's say, a, a good uh, op portfolio of solutions and options for users, uh, depending on the requirements of the application but at the same time being connected and being, uh, let's say, uh, useful in terms of uh, composability and, uh, you, know, you know, the deployment of apps that can be, uh, can work together in different networks. So when I go to the Polygon website, right, the main Polygon website, and I go to solutions, there's three things listed under, under you know, like ZK. One is Polygon Zero, one is Polygon Maiden, and the third is Polygon ZK EVM, which is which is your project, the project we are interviewing right now. What's the difference between uh, Maiden ZK EVM and Polygon Zero? Yes, well, we have uh, uh, Polygon was investing in ZK teams in twenty twenty one, and this was the announcement of the uh, merge with. Uh, Polygon, uh, sorry, for Hermes Network, which is our project. There was also the acquisition of uh, uh, the MIR protocol, which is uh, Polygon Zero now, and also the setup of the protocol, uh, sorry, the project Polygon Maiden. Uh, the, the approach was kind of uh, uh, 
a strategy of the diversification in different approaches, because as we discussed before, uh, one year and a half ago, two years ago, it was not clear which was the good approach to follow. And with this model, Polygon was basically hedging on the three approaches which we discussed today. So uh, it turns out that we were the first team to ship and uh, the, ten, the first team to, to get to the position of shipping a mainnet, which is amazing, but the other teams are also working in parallel. And we had, during this time, we had this, um, let's say, contribution, mutual contribution, because Jordi explained before, we were targeting uh, big computation pools to, to make this feasible. And in terms of cost, we had a lot of doubts, but uh, with these internal contributions, especially Polygon Zero, we were able to accelerate the prover like 40 times. Uh, so we have today the, the, the high performance and the low cost we have. So we are in a combination of different approaches together with internal collaboration. And uh, we are getting to the point where we will be, you know, define, defining well, which was the, let's say, role model, the model for deployment, uh, deployment of Polygon networks. And as I said, we have uh, this, this type 2 CKBM solution, which is ours. We also will be targeting type 1. And we also have a new VM approach. So all of these projects make sense for, for us and still, as we discussed today, we feel like no single solution will fit for everyone because there will be different needs for different applications. Uh, our intention is to uh, connect all these solutions as we are able to finish these projects and uh, you know get this kind of uh, internal collaboration. And we are learning a lot. We are getting a lot of experience on this CK rollup development. And uh, this is kind of a you know, the commitment of Polygon is to scale Ethereum to build the best solution uh, for, for, you know, the, the Ethereum space. And we are following this strategy that's a little bit, you know, diversification to, to be, uh, you know, leading this uh, in, in many ways. So uh, but what I can say is that this strategy will be explained very soon. And the, the idea behind this is that we can provide connected ecosystem in Polygon, so we can have different types of service um, for for any application. But CK will be kind of the, the basis for all this strategy. Since we're getting a lot of experience and, and uh, let's say, learnings, and we have a very strong team on this uh, aspect, CK is going to be the the driver for all this uh, evolution of uh, the, the portfolio of solutions of Polygon. Cool, cool. That's really interesting. So there will be like the Polygon POS chain, which is the currently operational chain. And then there will be the super nets. So there might be a lot of different super nets. Then there will be a Polygon ZK EVM network, which is the network you are launching specifically. And then there might be other ZK based networks, maybe it's two of them. Um, that might come into production later on. And of course, as in the future, the Polygon team may launch even other networks as well. So, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large vision, right? <laughs> well, but at the end, at the end is a scaling Ethereum. <laughs> we provide very uh, some more clarity soon in terms of how this connects together. But uh, as you see, we have uh, several initiatives that uh, we want to just uh, connect so so the pol the polygon ecosystem becomes uh, let's say simple and clear uh, today with this new uh, network we are we are preparing for launch it's clear that this question makes total sense but uh, very soon will be will be just explained and clear because today we are focusing basically on this shipment and we are just uh, you know all the forces put us just together on this uh, initiative to, to be successful. Okay, so let's, let's then zoom into this this network that you'll be launching. Uh, what are kind of the different roles in the network? Like, for example, if I think of Bitcoin, I imagine oh, the miner is a role, mining pool is a role, and node, full node is the third role. Uh, to understand your network, what, what, are, what are kind of like the important roles that that we that we need to grasp. We have 
we have to, yeah, we have mainly two roles. Okay. One is the, the sequencer. Call it centralized sequencer, but uh, just to just to be clear, the network is going to be decentralized or with a lot, so with a lot, with a sort of decentralization. Sequencer, the only thing that can do is just uh, select which transactions um, are inserting in the network. But, uh, for example, the network is going to be censorship resistant. That means that if a user wants to send a transaction and this uh, centralized sequencer don't, don't wants to include this transaction, the user can always do an L1 transaction, including these L2 transactions, and then the sequencer will be forced to include this transaction as well. The sequencer have two options, either include these transactions or do nothing. But if you don't do nothing, then it is a time mode and then anybody can be a sequencer. Okay. So uh, this is not, I mean, if you are a little bit purist, this is not fully decentralization because a sequencer has the right to kick people out of the network. You know, it's like, it's not a universal service, okay? But the sequencer cannot steal the phones or even lock the phones of a user, okay? So that's the, the, the model that we have. It's not perfect, but it's like, uh, it's, it's a long, it's a long way to, 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 so it's a lot of the properties of decentralization. You, you have it with this network, okay? And the only, the other role is the prover or the provers, you know, and here in the provers, the idea is, well, at the beginning, uh, we are going to be the main prover, but uh, at some point it's going to be a kind of a market of the prover, but this prover, they cannot do much. They are just uh, taking a state that's already, so the transactions are already on chain. And what you are doing is just generating the proof. What is, is converting an implicit state to an explicit state and pushing that state on chain so that the people can withdraw. Okay. It's like consolidating the state and change, but you, but the state is already defined. The transactions are already there. You, anybody can compute this state. So it's, it's a state is a, the state is already known. So the prover cannot modify the state, cannot change the, the network. They can, uh, you know, they can, uh, delay, uh, uh this, uh, this pu pu publication of the state, but that's the maximum that, that, that can do. And I mean, we are always going to run a prover, uh, uh, even on just as a backup. Okay. So that's the, the, that's the thing. And it's going to be a, here a market for that. So it's going to be some money that's going to be in the network and, uh, first come first serve. So if you, some money, if you have a prover, you just generate the proof and, and somebody will, somebody will prove it. There is a full mechanism. You can maybe read more on that, but it's, uh, it's going to be a market for the prover in, in the midterm. At the beginning, we, we, we are, we are going to be the ones that, so the idea is that in the beginning, the smart contract, we are going to be the only prover as far as we are following the, as, as far as we are creating proofs. If we stop creating proof, then anybody will be able to, to generate proofs. Okay. This gives us a lot of warranty. Okay. For example, this, this approach allows us, for example, if there is a, an issue in the soundness of the, of the proof, uh, I mean, we are going to, so, okay. Uh, we could generate a malicious proof, but we are going to generate the right proof. So we are not going to prove something that's wrong. Okay. So this give us, uh, so if the user trust us, so that means that even if the prover is, 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 if the system is bad, we are not going to generate a proof that's invalid. So this give us uh, some confident, uh, confident, so some, some confident, if you have this trust, you can get this confidence of using the, on using the network. It's not the final goal because the final goal is to be, fully decentralized so that you don't have to trust us that we are going to run a malicious prover. That's why it's important that the prover is okay. That's why it's important to audit the proof and that the prover is okay. But uh, at least for the launch, uh, we have this warranty that the users that are going to use the launch, if there is something wrong in the, in the proof and we are not doing crazy things, then uh, the, they will not lose the funds. So, so if I imagine it like this, so let's say, you know, like I'm a user on a, on a mobile and I have some assets on, on this network. When I create a transaction, um, I can use whatever mobile wallet I'm already used to for Ethereum. I send the transaction. The difference to Ethereum will be in, in this case, my transaction is going to go to a sequencer and there's only one uh, at launch. So it goes there. That sequencer is kind of receiving transactions from users and it's like creating the block. It's batching them and creating the block and publishing, hey, here's the block. Then there is a prover, which there's only one at launch, but in the, in later it, there'll be many. And these 
these provers are taking the block and they are then running the ZK EVM prover and then they're creating sort of a certificate saying, hey, this block, uh, these transactions are genuine and this block takes the state from S to S prime and here's a certificate for, uh, for that. And then on the other side, if when I'm on my mobile, I can essentially ask the Polygon network, hey, tell me your state and give me a proof that that state is correct. And the Polygon network can, can do, can, your network can, can do that on the other side. There are three stage, three stages. You describe two, but there are actually it's a three stages uh, thing. It's like it's, if you are the user, you create a transaction, you send this transaction to the sequencer, and the sequencer will create the block immediately. So here you will have a finality maybe of one two seconds. This is, I mean, this is as fast as far as you are trusting the sequencer. This is going to be final. You know, this is going to be the so the sequencer is gonna is promising you that it's gonna publish that transaction. Of course. It's a centralized model. You need to trust the sequencer. If you don't trust the sequencer, you cannot do anything with that information. But if you are trusting the sequencer, at least you know that 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 this is the first stage. Okay. The second stage is the sequencer will put this transaction uh, on chain. Okay. But will not generate the proof. It will put this data availability. At this point, the transaction is 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 final. You don't need to trust the sequencer. You know that this transaction is going to be executed. Uh, so actually, because you know that, that that transaction is being executed, you can compute the state. Okay, you can actually you can manually and any user can check that the state is 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 is, is the the current one. The only thing is that the network the, the the chain don't know which is the state. So the only thing that you will in this stage, the only thing that you will not be able to do is withdraw funds. And it's a third stage, or maybe once every half an hour or whenever, okay, it's going to be a proof that will prove all the, all the blocks that are in the middle and we'll put this, okay, the current state at this point is this one. Okay. And this is the consolidated state. So the state is going to be that in the network. And this is that point where you will be able to withdraw the, to withdraw the funds. Okay. But actually it's these three, three, three stages. One is finality of one, two seconds. That's the sequencer you trust. Then, Another that's going to be, I don't know the numbers yet, but it's going to be every few minutes. I don't know, maybe two, three, four minutes. That's going to be a, 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 a transaction with all the, uh, with the data availability, with all the transactions that uh, will need to be sequenced. And a third and a, a final that's going to be every half an hour that it's like this uh, consolidated state that will, will allow you to withdraw. These are the, the three stages. Let me kind of dig in here a little bit. So I'm not so worried about the prover because in principle, anyone can run a prover, right? So basically, even if there's only one at the network launch, I could build a prover and I would be economically incentivized to do so. So it, to me, it's kind of akin to kind of having people who liquidate underwater loans on make or something, right? So basically, this is kind of, to me, a very similar um, proposition. Um, I'm a little bit... Um, more skeptical about the centralization of the sequencer because i mean you said that i can always kind of force being included by sending this to l1 this is correct but in a way i'm still economically locked in if it's not economically viable to actually send this to l1 it's kind of like saying um okay you are on an island and there is one um there's one airline that actually services the island, say it's Lufthansa, uh, and Lufthansa kind of refuses to give me a ticket, um, right? And Lufthansa says, uh, and I say, well, I'm stuck here now. And Lufthansa will say, well, you could always rent a private jet. And I mean, obviously, this is true. I could, I could charter a private jet, but it would be very expensive, much more expensive than just being included by Lufthansa. And for many transactions, it wouldn't actually be viable to kind of escalate to layer one. So technically, you're not locked in, but economically, you are, right? Well, uh, I, I mean, yeah, but you know, the, the, you will have to pay this, this, this ticket, but, and you probably, you are not going to go to that island anymore. Okay. But at least you are not going to be stick there. So it's like Lufthansa warranties you. So it's like, it's not like a, a private, I would not say a private, uh, jet is like a Lufthansa. You have a way. So you have an, this case is the layer one, but you have a, like a judge that can force Lufthansa to sell you a ticket for, a limited price, which is the layer one cost. So, I mean, but I need to pay the judge, right? 
you need to pay see yeah exactly yeah yeah it's it's gonna cost you but so this is so this is why it's not uh, perfectly decentralized. This is not the perfect, but at least you will not get a stick in the island. You will leave the island, and you probably will not come back. Agree? And oh, definitely will not come back. <laughs> definitely. Exactly. No, no, not a good island experience. But it's not. But you, the, the important is that you are not going to get a stock in the in the island. Okay, so that's the important part here. So that's the yeah. The the idea here is to to preserve the properties of a censorship resistant. Uh, because we are launching this network uh, with a trusted sequencer, with a single one. So what we want to provide is, you know, uh, this this property. So everyone is just, uh, you know, relaxed about, I have the option to do it. Of course, the sequencer will process all, all transactions, but at least we have provided this mechanism that you don't need to trust anyone here because you will be able to do it in some way. But the next step will be to decentralize sequencing also. So okay, so that's on the roadmap model, to kind of have a decentralized yes. sequencer. Yes, exactly. So I assume, Jody, this is going to be your next job after uh, all the optimization. I don't know if it's going to be my job, but for someone in Polygon, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But okay. yeah, so yeah, but it's important. Yeah, it's, this is an important piece here. Uh, you can an, an interesting way to see a, a, a sequencer. Is a is a consensus. It's a consensus. Uh, it's a consensus system. Of course, it's a centralized system. Is I would say it's a dictatorship uh, consensus system. So it's the, the the consensus is what the centralized says. It's a consensus. Okay, I mean it's very trivial consensus way, but you can substitute the sequencer with any consensus mechanism you want to put here. Okay, so you can you can put uh, proof of authority. You can do the proof of stake. Even uh, you know you can you can put whatever whatever consensus uh, mechanism here. And, and it, it's, I mean, then you have the limitations of the consensus, okay? But, you know, maybe you will not have the same finality and so on, and you will get in the trilemma, uh, uh, in, in the trilemma balance, but it's perfectly doable. And here in, in Polygon, we have a lot of experience in, in consensus, in creating consensus, uh, consensus networks. Let's let's talk about the gas. So obviously, all of this is not for free. So you need to pay the sequencer, the prover, and um, you also need to pay the layer one, right? Because you have these periodic check-ins where obviously kind of data is stored on L one. Um, so how how does the gas model work on zk EVM? So from I mean, let's see, we got two things. So from the end user perspective, the model. It's going to be exactly the same that uh, the uh, that layer one. It's going to be gas, and you pay for 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 you put a gas price, and and then, so it works exactly the same. And we are using and the way that uh, smart contracts work, it's we are equivalent. So it's like uh, uh, so all the codes is going to cost you. So the in in, in gas in gas quantity is going to cost you exactly 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 the same. Okay. Oh, this is, is super that, interesting. I would have I would have imagined that there are opcodes that are more expensive on ZKEVM just because they're difficult to implement. And I mean, mispriced opcodes is really it, it's a danger for the for the network, right? If you actually offer opcodes that are more expensive for you to actually process than people are paying for them. But we can regulate that with the gas price. So maybe the the, the idea is that depending on the transaction that you are doing. So in general, the transactions are gonna are gonna cost you the same. Uh, because at the end it's a kind of an average, okay? So the sequencer will, will work. But if you are doing exchange transactions, for example, a transaction that's doing a loop of Ketchaks or a transaction that's putting a lot of data availability in there. So if you are doing this kind of transactions, what you can see is that the sequencer, they may ask you for more, uh, for a bigger gas price. Okay, so basically it's not it's not a fixed price. So basically it's not a fixed price it's gonna gonna be a fixed price for if you are doing crazy things. If you are, you know, just doing normal transactions, uh, should be more or less the same. And the sequencer decides what's crazy. Mm, yeah, well, it's if it fits in the blocks or doesn't fit in the block on how it, it, it occupates that. Yeah. If you are look, for example, if you, data availability, the cost of data availability is gonna be the same. So a call data. Uh, it's the same. If you want to put the data in the call data, that means that the cost is going to be the same for L1 and L2. Here you will not have savings. Okay. Uh, so if you are putting transactions with a relatively normal uh, uh, call data, okay, um, which call data in general is like uh, less than one percent of the of the cost of the transaction. So 
it's not going to be what the, the cost would. But if you are creating a specific transaction that puts uh, 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 a lot of data, then maybe the the, 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 the sequencer has a right to not include that transaction or to uh, charge you more. But we are expecting that the normal users will not see any difference on that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree that basically within normal use, this is not an issue at all. It's just that basically if you have... I mean, so in many respects, kind of governance minimization at these layers is kind of a great goal. And basically saying, well, if anything's too crazy, the, the sequencer can can um, uh, can throw it out or not include it or charge more. Um, it kind of, it opens a floodgate in a way. So basically I, I um, yeah. It's a centralized sequencer, yeah. Yeah, it, maybe it's not it's not that big a deal. It's just, uh, yeah. I mean, if if there's a clear if if there's a clear way of atta attacking the network and it could only react via like some governance mechanism, yeah. But okay, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, kind of sequence of decentralization on your roadmap, anyways. There are some denial of service attacks there uh, to the sequencer. That this is one of the important topics uh, to deal so there so you're right here that the, the you need to but you know I mean a normal web page it's like like a normal like any other centralized service you know a normal web page is also uh, exposed to the needle of service attacks okay and they need Absolutely. to be protected against that. so that's it's a centralized system and they will have uh, protections like any other centralized system so it's a centralized sequencer this is what it is when we talk about the centralized sequencer then uh, things just uh, the rules change. Okay, but uh, sorry, I, I kind of interrupted your explanation about the gas in the. So basically, kind of you you kind of pay um, a uh, proportional amount of gas for each opcode you use, and that's kind of what the user sees. But basically, what the network does is kind of it has to pay like different actors, so the sequencer, the prover, as well as the L one as a service provider. Um, so how is that handled? Well, the sequencer just the just well, it has an economic an economic engine somehow. But the idea is uh, uh, how much I will get. It's the same like a miner, you know. It's like how much I will get if I include this transaction, and if it's profitable, they will include it. If uh, and if not, it will not include it, and it will take just the most profitable transactions, uh, as much profitable transactions they can in the in the sequencer. It's I mean as as easy as that, and if you want as complex as that, because you know. Um, if, how much profitable is the transaction? Then you need to check that transaction, and you need to, to you need to, and this is where the all the complexity of the sequencer comes. But uh, the idea is very simple: is you have a, a, a back pool of transactions, you select the ones that are more profitable, and you need you need to pay all the costs. Okay, you need to pay the the gas, the prover, the data availability. You need to pay all the all the all the things in there. You need to take that in account. So, um, the gas costs for the user on Polygon, Polygon ZK EVM, they kind of, they rise in lockstep with gas costs on L1, right? Because basically if committing these um, things to L1 rises in price, kind of there's no way for you to not pass this on to the user. Do you see that as a limiting factor? Well, somehow it's, it's going to be a direct correlation. So it's going to be a direct correlation between the price of L2 in the, with the price of L1. Definitely is going to be there, especially for this, you know, for that availability, the cost. So a lot of the costs, uh, most of the costs actually are, are, are related to the layer one. So yeah, uh, it's like, uh, yeah, the cost of transport depends on the cost of the oil. Well, yeah, transport you need you need oil, so that's it's it's, it's a correlation. No, that, that's the, the the benefit the benefit of having data availability layer one is also yes has this problem because the the security of uh, you know putting all these transactions in layer one is higher and you know the cost of layer one uh, needs to be you know included in the cost for a user in layer two. So um, you talked about this network of different networks earlier, um, you know, within the Polygon family. Um, will there be like a flowchart um, on the Polygon website where basically I say I want to deploy a DAP that kind of has these and these requirements and this is kind of the security guarantees I, I would like. Um, and you guys will tell me, okay, then do not deploy to uh, Polygon ZKEVM, deploy to, I don't know, uh, 
Polygon POS. Yes, exactly. This is the objective we will will have to, for this year. So, so, what kind of applications do you see living on Polygon zk EVM in the in the mid to long run? Well, uh, we have this uh, path of two, two optimizations. As Jordi was saying, we have uh, a lot of in the backlog. We, we closed in some way a release to to launch this first version, but. Uh, the CKVM has the constraints of uh, the proof in layer one, which is the CK rollup normal model. And also we have them the constraint of data availability in layer one. Uh, for us, the, the proving cost is becoming a little part of the, the cost for users. Uh, every time we optimize, it's lower and lower. So basically, it's data availability. Then most of the cost will, will be that. Also, there will be some fees for the prover and all you know, this. this Normal things. Uh, the, the the network needs to get some kind of benefit for for the participants in some way. But at the same time, uh, we, we we have a plan also to optimize data availability cost. And uh, the idea here is to to just uh, specify which are the benefits in terms of finality, throughput, cost for users. Uh, we feel like the the applications that require better security in terms of data availability, like for example, for example, DeFi. Uh, they are very, very interested in CKVM because we are bringing this uh, higher level of security, both in, you know, it's a layer two, but you have some smart contracts, but you have data on chain and you have this uh, proving that provides uh, super fast finality because we are talking about finality under one hour, more or less. So this for, for this kind of applications is very important uh, to have this, uh, you know, fast movements in liquidity. Uh, probably applications with a lower value transactions, like gaming, I don't know, this probably will be a better fit in the in the POS or other networks that have data of chain. But we see that uh, there's a big market of on, on high value um, transactions that uh, are very interested in the CPV. Uh, NFTs, it's also there are having a lot of interest in, in that, you know, for all these NFTs markets and you know, movies that's real value. You know, it's an, an NFT that has a specific, some, some value in there and you want to warranty because you can have the NFT in the layer one so you don't need to require the breach and, 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 and then you are uh, moving and, and working it in layer two. That's another important application that looks like it's coming. But, you know, there are many and it's it's not, it's a... Uh, it's you know it's a chain that's a wild world chain. So I'm sure it's going to be a lot of applications that I don't even uh, I'm aware of. One of the interesting topics in the whole zk space is the question of licensing. So the novel 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 part of this of the system is uh, the prover, right? Like the thing that will uh, that will essentially take the blocks and generate the the proofs uh, for the correct state transition. What is your licensing approach as Polygon ZK EVM for your prover? Yes. Well, this is something uh, we are discussing, uh, but our approach in the long run is going to be open source for sure, because uh, everything we build is open source. We are building uh, with source code available since July last year. As we said, we are sharing a lot of ideas and and the, the code with the, with the whole community. For us, there's a path towards, uh, you know, decentralization also that we want to accomplish. Now we are involved in the audits. It's about security also. But then we have a plan for bug bounties. We are launching this beta mainnet. We have a path of decentralization. And we have also to include a value accrual formatic token into this uh, CKVM. So there's a, the project is not over in terms of the full product. And uh, we are just... Uh, you know, thinking on, on the license we, we want to put uh, because we will put a license uh, that kind of uh, specifies the the use you can do with this code before the mainnet. So it's something we will do very soon. But uh, the spirit for us is that uh, this becomes available eventually because we want uh, to cover with our roadmap and we also want to make this as a public uh, available good as we are just uh, using some other you know, technology from other teams, uh, we are happy other teams can use uh, our uh, technology too. In fact, the only the only repository that doesn't have a permissive license is the prover. For the rest, as I said before, the whole tooling, the client, all of this is open source and 
anyone can just uh, use this code. So this is something that's important, eh? it's because first, so um, that the code is available is probably the most important thing, because, you know, if you want to trust the system, you need to at least understand what's what's going on and you need to see, you know, you need to you need to verify. So anybody should be able to verify that what you're running is what it is. So the first thing is that the code needs to be available. We have in we open we open all the all the repos in, in, in July and this gives us a lot of uh, uh, confidence, you know, during these uh, six months or, or eight months, uh, many developers have checked on that and you now have issues and for uh, uh, checking bugs or for even for doing proposals. So this is, has been available from there and this is very important from the security perspective and this is a must, you know, the system must be open. Uh, so you need to see what's what's moving and needs to be verifiable. You need to check that what's in the network is actually what's what's in there. So this is the first step and this is already there, okay? The the second thing is all about the knowledge. You know, all the, you know, uh, all the, so the, we are showing all the knowledge and, but not only that, all the tooling, you know, right now, all the languages to write that, all the tooling that we use for write that, all the, um, the verifier, the pillar start, the start generation. So all the, all the, all the tooling that's usable by third parties, you know, for, for other uh, projects, this is already, uh, in, uh, MIT and Apache license. So anybody can use that. Okay, so the only piece is that the prover, and what here, what we are just trying trying to protect is just having some opportunistic uh, person just creating their own token, just cut and pasting the 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 cut and pasting the same way that happens with Uniswap or that happened with uh, Buba Networks or happen in this space. We don't want to, we don't like this model, we don't want this to happen, and this is what we are trying to avoid. Besides that. If you are doing a project that's a serious project, you want to use that, I mean, this should be open and the spirit is that. So we are against the, just the opportunistic people that just taking profit of uh, others, uh, things worth uh, by that. That's what, that's the only thing that we want to protect. And, but besides that, uh, everything should be open and, and visible and usable and learning and that. This is the spirit that's behind the 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 licensing that we are trying to 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 achieve but again we are deciding that and it's going to be available very soon yeah so from from my perspective yeah it, it makes sense that you're trying like one thing that you're trying to do is prevent somebody else from launching a roll up with your technology before you do and getting the press attention and that makes complete sense, right? I would even go one step further. I mean, it, it makes conceptual sense for me to say, you know, six months after, it, for the first six months after your mainnet is live, if the prover is not open source, you're trying to get some kind of competitive lead on the market before it becomes open source and other people can, can use it. That is also actually, to me, understandable. You've put in a lot of effort you want a competitive edge, right? Like the the question I I mean this the central element of my question is the time horizon beyond the six month where I see projects in the ecosystem which are trying to say okay the prover is open source but the license is such that if it emits a proof it can only be verified by a white list of approved verifiers. Right? There are projects attempting a licensing strategy like that, which is existing beyond the six month scale, beyond getting the early competitive advantage. Do you have plans in that direction? No, no, we will not do that. I mean, once the licensing says applied, it's going to be full of controls. So no, no plans for limiting, you know, this kind of things. Our model is not a license. It's not a license based. So, or the business model of course is not a license based. So we are not selling licenses or, uh, I mean, or, or, or charging for royalties or things like that. This is not our, our model and this is not what we want to do. We are just, so the thing is that, so we, we are based, we want to open source, we are want to contribute, we want to contribute to the Ethereum space, we want to contribute to the blockchain space, we want this to be open. It's already open, you know, all the tooling is already open and we are just trying to protect, uh, you know, it has been a huge investment in resources and in, in money, in effort and, 
it's a lot of people that have trust in, in, in Polygon, and they're just trying to protect this investment for a while so that nobody just take profit, I would say, uh, unfair profit uh, of that. Okay, And, you know, uh, if this never happened in the space, I would argue that, okay, why are you doing that? But the problem is that we have, we have I, I mentioned some, but there are a lot of examples uh, in the space that this has happened. And this is, I think, it's a bad practice. It's something that uh, we need to avoid and we need to have uh, to respect that. So that's this and this kind of licensing, uh, I mean, other projects has been forced to do that. Probably for me, it's it's hard eh, because it goes even against my principles uh, having this. You know, I would love to to do everything open source from the first day and also that. But I understand that there is these these things and we need to protect against these things and and we need to have to do something. Okay, and I think this is the less the the best thing that we can do for that. Okay, that's just the that that's just a decision, and in any case, it's going to be a temporal thing. So, in the very beginning. Uh, you guys told us that all of this kind of started as a side project while you were trying to to uh, create a decentralized identity. T tell us about this DID project and where it's at right now, because it never really stopped, right? I mean, it's still going on. Yeah, it never stopped and uh, probably will never stop <laughs> because it's... Uh, something we wanted to do from the beginning. Uh, Jordi can, can explain better. I, I would say now is uh, inside Polygon. Also, we have Polygon ID as part of the portfolio we are uh, developing. Uh, we are creating this kind of uh, infrastructure uh, on identity, self-sovereign identity, blockchain-based. Uh, we will be focusing a lot on the Web3 space because uh, every time we understand better that uh, the apps need this identity layer. And basically, what we want to do in this project is the Polygon style, provide a, a public infrastructure that uh, can just uh, uh, enable the, the development of the ecosystem of participants on this uh, identity infrastructure, like uh, issuers of trust, um, consumers of trust, uh, users, the apps, all of this around, around Polygon. And probably around Polygon, and that would mean around EVM. To be honest, because it's beyond Polygon, we are in the in the Ethereum space, and this probably will will the the idea is that it becomes a public good that every a project in the EVM space can reuse. Uh, but yes, this is how how it is today. Probably Jordi can explain better how this started or why it makes sense for us. Well, so sovereign identity is an important part uh, of decentralization. I mean, is <laughs> way to see it is like the login. So any application needs a kind of login. I would say most of applications needs login. Maybe a payment application don't need a login, but that's probably the exception. You know, if you want to do any uh, application, you need some some sort of login, reputation, identity. You need to prove something to do things, uh, to do things. And this is what the identity project was about. And, and this is an important part, it's an important layer that needs to be solved. And in Iden3, I mean, we started that, uh, we realized that the privacy in this layer was very important. And so the, we started with zero knowledge, then we moved to rollups, but uh, the, the the spirit of the Iden3 has been always uh, there. And right now, uh, said Polygon, there is an important team that's continuing on working in, 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 that, in that direction. Right now, yeah, you know, they are doing a lot of progress uh, right now on that. I'm a little bit aside on that because I'm focused in the ZKVM, but I know that there is a, a very uh, amazing team that that's that's uh, pushing hard on that and having great ideas and and, and yeah, following the this this project. So obviously, building a um, decentralized. Um, identity is super hard unless you want it to be completely public. So I mean, it's 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 kind of it's also zk based. Um, there's there's a lot of um, questions as as to kind of how do you go about the civil um, problem? Um, who kind of gets to attest what and so on? How do you think about these questions? Because it's such it's such a large problem space that it's difficult to even know where to start. <laughs> well, let me let me explain you how I see identity because we are talking about in a, at least how I see identity is a very 
infrastructure layer, very basic layer. Okay, so you can understand identity as 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 identities, you know, users. If you want public private key, if you want to do it super simple, okay, so you have your 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 identities represented by your private key and your public uh, public key. That's the easiest way to see it. Okay, then you have a, a, a database of uh, claims. So a claim is or attestation is something that you say in general about some other identity, but can be anything. Okay, this database is a decentralized database. You hold part of this database, and and some of these are part of this database may be on, on chain, but most of them should be off chain. And it's going to be maybe if you are doing a claim over David, you will hold part of this database, and David will hold this part of this this other database. Okay, and it's uh, so, and the idea is that each identity owns their own data, their own their own information. Okay, so that's the idea of us sovereign out here. Okay, and with this database, then the idea is a proving system that's running on top of that. And if you want, it's a query system. It's like you can ask uh, for a specific information, and the other can prove that this specific information is is is, is valid. So we have this proving system that's uh, running on top of this database. This is. Uh, what it is, the basic, the infrastructure. And with this, you can build anything. You can build a reputation system. I mean, you can uh, do a centralized login or you can build a, a, a proof of uh, individual. Uh, or, you know, maybe if you hold 10 uh, people with reputation, you can do uh, every ev everything you want. But of course, building the specific uh, uh, reputation system or application system or how you are going to use this uh, basic identity. This is going to be dependent, so it's going to be uh, application specific or user specifics. And some, but the, for me, the basic layer that needs to be solved is this: that uh, universal, that anybody can create uh, an identity or as many identities as they want. An identity is nothing more than a, that a, like a public-private key, or it's a, may, maybe a little bit more. But that's that's the basic thing. Okay, anybody can do claims on any other identities and this is there is a notary not, notarization system so this is database anchored in the blockchain so that when you are when you are doing a claim is you know that it, it's claim at this time and you can always prove that okay and this is the you know this is the basic uh, infrastructure the, the basic idea of ident3 and and the end they, the, the, the original ident3 project was to build the, the this basic uh, protocol and now we are uh, leveraging so we are put, we are using this ident3 protocol just to to build polygon id which is all these services and all these libraries and all this tooling to 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 work with this protocol yeah our idea here is to to connect all these uh, issues of trust. There are many amazing projects working on uh, solving the problem, for example, of civil resistance or proof of uniqueness, this kind of uh, utility that actually the applications need uh, to operate, especially in the blockchain space. So our, as Jordi was saying, we were building this, we are building this uh, infrastructure layer, but we have two, two interesting properties to trying to attract all this ecosystem of uh, development around identity, uh, which is, uh, let's say, connecting the, the format of credential, verifiable credential that's based on the standards. We have a, a model of presentation of these credentials that's zero knowledge friendly. And this concept, we are able to use CK to prove uh, attributes about uh, users in a private way. And we, we have, it, from the beginning, we took this privacy as the main property of the protocol. And uh, this is the, the origin of Circom, all these CK works that Jordi started. But we have this as a say, embedded property with a specific language to connect between issuers of trust, users, and applications. And also uh, the second property is that we are we have solved the on-chain interaction. So the the identity protocols we have a lot, even based on blockchain, but basically they operate off-chain because the the way the communication happens between users, wallets, and applications and issuers. In the, in the on-chain interaction is complex, so we have managed to connect this uh, format of verifiable credentials with the on-chain interactions. So here is where we expect that we can trigger a lot of uh, impact in the ecosystem of Web3. As Polygon, we have a lot of applications, the apps already using Polygon network, and we expect that we can create some kind of reusable reputation built on top of these uh, credentials. So users can uh, uh, reuse this, this reputation across many applications. 
th that makes it so much easier for the user, but it's also a great value add for the network because it creates like the stickiness that otherwise you might not have. So uh, I think we probably doing an entire episode on a decentralized identity system. This is probably what we'll have to do at some point. Um, let's kind of stick with your predictions um, for the ZK ecosystem for this year, next year. So what um, what are your plans for the rest of this year after mainnet launch? And how, how do you see this space progressing over, the, say, the next two years or so? Well, we have a very clear plan. Actually, I'm, I know, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, nervous even because we you know, right now I have like the team, uh, stop. It's not that stop because we are preparing the launch and we have a lot of work in the audits on launch, but we have a lot of things to improvements to do. And, 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 and we have a lot of things in the backlog that we want to improve. We, we want to improve, uh, the costs. We want to improve the, 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 the compatibility. You know, we have to implement, we go, we are going to lay a type one. So we want to have a, so we have some pre-compatible smart contracts that we need to implement and we, we, we need to do some, uh, uh, to, to grow in this compatibility. There is also this, uh, and decentralization, yeah? there is a uh, moving to decentralization, decentralized sequencer and, and so on. So this is a clear roadmap for the, for the end, uh, for the next, uh, year is, is very clear, very specific, I would say, uh, on that, uh, David, maybe you want to complement the polygon side. No, no, you say you already said, uh, we are, we are closing a release because we want to, as Jordi was saying before, we have been auditing for three months already. So this means that we froze the code a lot and we have many interesting things in the backlog to implement, uh, because in the end, this, this project was about scaling Ethereum. So we need to follow this path of uh, acceleration of, you know, providing more TPS, providing bigger, better cost and providing, let's say, more equivalence. Uh, also, other, other objective is to, to complete decentralization in many, in many lives and to provide value equal automatic token, as I said before. So for us, this is the, the whole year in the, in the perspective we have today. Fantastic. And where can people go to find out more about um, Polygon ZK EVM? So to, to, to learn how to build on it, uh, to join the community, uh, to hear about updates, where should they go? Well, you go to Polygon webpage and there's a Polygon wiki site with the documentation for all the Polygon products. Uh, if you go to the sub page of Polygon CKVM, you will find also the, the information of the product documentation and how to interact. Uh, for us, the, the team is uh, excited about this launch and uh, happy to, to just answer questions or, or respond to, to inquiries. Yeah, there is also the repositories and you know, all the repositories are public. So checking, if, especially if you are a developer, you know, just checking the code and the repositories, there's a lot of information there that you can check. And there is also, I, you know, if you check, uh, in general, I used to give, uh, to give a conference or a talk or something like every month or something like that. So there is a lot of, uh, conference that you can also check. Just, uh, just Google me and, and, and it's a lot of information out there. <laughs> I, I love this. Uh, David's, David's take on how to get in, get in touch was a uh, website and, you know, go to the contact us set, set section and draw the, oh, GitHub, pull request. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, that, I mean, that's a, the, that's the easiest, <laughs> that's the easiest way. <laughs> you heard it here first. Thank you guys for coming on. Um, it was a super fun, very long episode. Um, and I feel like I learned a lot about how the ZK EVM works and um, uh, how it's going to complement the Ethereum ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.